Chapter twenty five of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter twenty five. London, April to September, eighteen twenty two. The essai historique sur les révolutions, its effect, letter from Lemierre, nephew of the poet. Life has often been represented, and I was one of the first to do so, as a mountain which we ascend on one side and descend on the other. It would be quite as correct to compare it to one of the Alps, with its bare brow crowned with eternal snow, and from which there is no descent. Following out this image, the traveller is always ascending and descends no more. He then has a better view of the space he has traversed, of the paths which he has not selected, and which would have led him by a gentler slope. He looks back with regret and grief on the point where he went astray. Thus the publication of the essay historique marks my first wandering step from the path of peace. I finished the first part of the great work I had traced out for myself. I wrote its last word between the idea of death, my illness had returned, and a vanished dream, insomnis venit imago conjugis the essay was printed by baylis and published by de in seventeen ninety seven this date is that of one of the transformations of my life there are moments when our destiny whether yielding to society or obeying nature or whether it is then beginning to mould us into the form we are to retain suddenly changes its direction as a river alters its course the essay offers a compendium of my existence as poet moralist civilian and politician it is unnecessary to say that i hope for great success to this work as much at least as i could hope for anything we authors little prodigies of a prodigious era aspire to commune in spirit with future generations but i think that we do not sufficiently know the dwelling of posterity and put the wrong address on our communications when we stiffen in the tomb death will so unrelentingly freeze our words written and sung that they will not melt like the frozen words of rabelais the essay was designed to be a sort of historical encyclopaedia the only volume published is in itself a very extensive investigation i had the rest in manuscript next came after some researches and annotations of the analyst the lays and virales of the poet the natures etc i can scarcely understand now how i could have carried on such extensive study amidst an active wandering life subject to so many vicissitudes my perseverance in labour explains this in my youth i often wrote for twelve or fifteen hours without moving from my seat striking out and recomposing the same page perhaps ten times age has in no degree weakened this faculty of application all my diplomatic correspondence is written by my own hand and yet it does not interfere with my literary labours the essay made a sensation among the emigres it was not in agreement with the feelings of my companions in misfortune my independence in my different social positions has almost always offended those in whose company i journeyed i have in turns been the chief of different armies the soldiers of which were not of my party i have led old royalists to fight for public liberties and especially for the liberty of the press which they detested i have rallied liberals in the name of this same liberty beneath the standard of the bourbons whom they hold in horror it so happened that the general opinion of the emigres was attached through self-love to my person the english reviews having mentioned me with praise this praise was reflected upon all the faithful I had sent copies of the essay to Larbe, Ganganet, and de Salle. Lemier, the nephew of the poet of the same name, and the translator of Gray's poems, wrote to me from Paris, July the 15th, 1797, that my essay had had the greatest success. One thing is certain, that if it was known for a moment, it was almost instantly forgotten again. A sudden shadow engulfed the first ray of my fame. Having almost become a personage, I was sought by the emigres of distinction in London, I moved from street to street. First I quitted Tottenham Court Road and settled myself in the Hampstead Road. Here I lodged for some months in the house of a Mrs. O'Larry, an Irish widow, the mother of a very pretty girl of fourteen, and who had a great partiality for cats. United by this similarity of taste, we had the misfortune to lose two elegant kittens, white as ermine, with black-tipped tails. Mrs. O'Larry's visitors were old lady neighbours, with whom I was obliged to take tea in the old fashion. Madame de Steele has described this scene in Corinne, at the house of Lady Engermon. My dear, do you think the water boils well enough to make the tea? My dear, I think it is a little too soon. 
there came also to these tea parties a tall handsome young irishwoman mary neale under the escort of a guardian she discerned some heart wound in my appearance for she said to me you carry your heart in a sling i carried my heart i know not how mrs o'larry left for dublin then always getting from the district of poor emigres in the east end i moved from lodging to lodging till i reached the district of rich emigres at the west end and took up my abode amidst the bishops the court families and the colonists of martinique pelletier had returned he had got married and was still the old boasting chatterer lavish of his complaisance and affecting the money of his neighbours more than their persons i made several new acquaintances especially in the circle where i had family connections christian de lamoignon who was severely wounded in the leg at quiberon and is now my colleague in the chamber of peers became my friend he introduced me to mrs lindsay who was attached to auguste lamoignon his brother le president guillaume was not made more of at basville between boileau madame de sevigné and bordeloup than i was among these three friends mrs lindsay of irish family with rather dry wit temperament a little brittle elegant figure and pleasing face had great nobleness of soul and elevation of character the emigres of merit passed their evenings at the fireside of the last of the ninons the old monarchy was expiring with all its abuses and all its graces it will some day be disinterred like those skeletons of queens decked with collars bracelets and earrings which are being discovered in etruria at this rendezvous i met m maluet and madame du Bellois, a woman worthy of esteem count montlosier and the chevalier de panat the last mentioned had a deserved reputation for talent untidiness in his person and epicureanism he belonged to that group of men of taste who formerly sat with their arms crossed before french society idle men whose mission was to see and judge everything they exercised the functions now performed by the newspapers without the harshness of the latter but also without their great popular influence Mondoisier had kept afloat on the fame of his renowned phrase of the croix de bois a phrase a little harshly treated by me when i reproduced it but true in the main on quitting france he went to coblentz ill received by the princes he had a quarrel fought one night by the banks of the rhine and was run through feeling unable to move and yet seeing no blood he asked the witnesses whether the point of the sword came out behind three inches replied they then it is nothing said montlosier sir draw back your thrust montlosier received in this way as the reward of his royalist sentiments crossed to england and took refuge in literature that great hospital for emigres in which i had a mattress near his he obtained the editorship of the courrier francais beside his newspaper he wrote physico-politico-philosophic works in one of these he proved that blue was the colour of life because the veins become blue after death life coming to the surface of the body to evaporate and return to the blue sky as i am very fond of blue i was quite charmed with this theory feudally liberal an aristocrat and a democrat a motley mind made up of pieces and fragments montrosier is very long in giving utterance to his out-of-the-way ideas but when he does succeed in bringing them to light they are sometimes fine and especially energetic an anti-priest as one of the nobility a christian from sophistry and as an amateur of antiquity he would have been under paganism a warm partisan of independence in theory and slavery in practice throwing the slave to the fishes in the name of the liberty of the human race a carper and caviller obstinate and rough the former deputy of the nobility of riom nevertheless permits himself to pay some court to power he knows how to take care of his interests but does not like or allow it to be perceived and shelters his weaknesses as a man behind his honour as a gentleman i have no wish to speak ill of my smoky auvergne with his romances of the mont d'or and his polemic treatise the plain i have a liking for his whimsical person his long obscure developments and circumvolutions of ideas with parentheses clearings of the throat and peevish oh oh annoy me anything dark and tangled misty and difficult to fathom is hateful to me but on the other hand i am diverted by this naturalist of volcanoes this failure of a pascal this gigantic orator who speechifies from the tribune as his little fellow countrymen sing at the top of a chimney i like this gazetteer of turf pits this liberal explaining the charter through a gothic window this gentleman shepherd half married to his milkmaid sowing his barley himself amongst the snow in his little field of pebbles i shall always be grateful to him for having dedicated to me in his chalet at puy de dom an old black rock taken from a gaulish cemetery which he had discovered the abbe de lille another countryman of sidonius apollinaris of the chancellor of the hospital of lafayette thomas and chamfort driven from the continent by the torrent of the republican victories 
had also come to settle in london the emigres were proud to number him in their ranks he sang our misfortunes another reason for loving his muse he worked very hard indeed he was obliged to do so for madame de lille shut him up and did not set him at liberty till he had done his daily work of a certain number of verses one day i went to see him he kept me waiting a long time and when he did make his appearance his cheeks were very red people said that madame de lille used to box his ears of that i know nothing i only say what i saw who has not heard the abbe de lille repeat his verses he recited them very well his countenance ugly wrinkled and animated by his imagination was wonderfully suited to the coquettish nature of his delivery to the character of his talents and to his profession of abbe the abbe de lille's chef d'oeuvre is his translation of the georgics always excepting the pieces of sentiment but it is like reading racine translated into the language of louis the fifteenth the literature of the eighteenth century putting a few bright stars of genius out of the question standing as it were halfway between the classic literature of the seventeenth century and the romantic literature of the nineteenth though not without what is natural is wanting in nature devoted to the arrangement of words it is neither sufficiently original as a new school nor sufficiently pure as an antique school the abbe de lille was the poet of modern chateaux as the troubadour was the poet of ancient ones the verses of the one and the ballads of the other give evidence of the difference which existed between aristocracy in its prime and aristocracy in its decrepitude the abbe describes readings and chess parties in the manor houses where the troubadours sang of crusades and tournaments the distinguished personages of our church militant were then in england the abbe caron of whom i have spoken when borrowing the life of my sister julie from him the bishop of st paul de leon a stern and narrow-minded prelate who contributed to make the count d'artois more and more a stranger to his contemporaries the archbishop of aix calumniated perhaps because of his success in the world and another learned and pious bishop but so avaricious that if he had had the misfortune to lose his soul he would never have repurchased it almost all avaricious men are men of talent i must therefore be very stupid amongst the french women of the west end was madame de boine amiable spirituelle full of talent extremely pretty and very young she has since in conjunction with her father the marquis d'osmond represented the court of france in england much better than such a savage as i she writes now and her talents will reproduce what she has seen with great cleverness Madame de Cormont, de Gonteau, and du Cluzel were also inhabitants of the quarter of fortunate emigrants, though I may perhaps be making a confusion with regard to Madame de Cormont and Madame du Cluzel, whom I had seen for a short time at Brussels. Certain it is that the Duchess de Durat was in London at this time, but it was not my fortune to become acquainted with her till ten years later. How many times in life do we pass by some object that would constitute its charm, as the navigator glides unconsciously over the waters, which lave the shores of a land favoured by heaven and which he has only missed by a few miles or by one day's sail i write this on the banks of the thames and to-morrow a letter will go to madame durin on the banks of the seine to tell her that i have met with the first souvenir of her End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 3, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 26. London from April to September, 1822. Fontaine, Clary. From time to time, the tide of emigration carried over to us companions of a new species and new opinions and different strata of exiles were formed. The earth contains beds of sand and clay deposited by the waves of the flood. One of these waves brought me a man, whose loss I still at this time deplore, a man who was my guide in literature, and whose friendship constituted one of the honours as well as one of the consolations of my life. In a previous part of these memoirs it has been mentioned that I had become acquainted with M. de Fontaine in 1789. It was only last year in Berlin I received news of his death. He was born at New York of a noble Protestant family. His father had had the misfortune to kill his brother-in-law in a duel. Young Fontaine, having been brought up by a very deserving brother, came to Paris. He saw Voltaire die, and this great representative of the eighteenth century inspired his first verses. His poetical attempts were noticed by Laharpe. 
he undertook the composition of some pieces for the theatre and formed a connection with mademoiselle des garcins a delightful actress he lodged near the odeon and wandering around the chartreuse he celebrated its solitude he had met with a friend destined to become one of mine m joubert on the occurrence of the revolution the poet embraced one of those stationary parties which always perish torn in pieces by the party in favour of progress which pulls it forward or the retrograde which draws it back the monarchist engaged m de fontaine as an editor of the moderateur when the evil days came he took refuge in lyon and there married his wife was confined of a son during the siege of the city which the revolutionists called commune affranchie as louis the eleventh by banishing all the citizens had called arras ville franchise madame de fontaine was obliged to remove her nursling's cradle in order to shelter it from the shells being again in paris on the ninth termidor m de fontaine joined m de la harpe and the abbe de vauxelles in establishing the memorial proscribed on the eighteenth fructidor england became his harbour of refuge m de fontaine was with chenier the last writer of the classical school of the elder branch his prose and his poetry resemble each other and have merits of the same kind his thoughts and images exhibit a melancholy unknown to the age of louis the fourteenth which knew nothing but the austere and holy sadness of religious eloquence this melancholy was found mingled in the works of the author of the jour des morts as the impress of the period in which he lived it fixes the date of his advent and proves that he was born after j j rousseau and attached by taste to fenelon were any one to reduce m de fontaine's writings to two very small volumes one of prose and one of verse they would constitute one of the most appropriate funereal monuments which could be raised over the tomb of the classical school in the papers which my friend left were several cantos of a poem called la grèce sauvée some odes and various other poetical pieces he never however published anything for this critic so acute and lightened and when not influenced by political opinion so impartial had himself an extreme terror of criticism he was supremely unjust towards madame de steel an envious article of garras upon the forêt de navarre was intended to stop her short at the very commencement of her poetical career fontaine on his appearance destroyed the affected school of dora but he was unable to re-establish the classical school which drew near its close with the language of racine among the posthumous odes of m de fontaine there is one upon the anniversaire de sa naissance a birthday ode it possesses all the charm of the jeu des morts with a deeper and more individual feeling i remember only two stanzas la vieillesse déjà vient avec ses souffrances que m'offre l'avenir de courte espérance que m'offre le passé des fautes des regrets tel est le sort de l'homme il s'instruit avec l'âge mais que sont d'être sage quand le terme est si près le passé le présent l'avenir toute m'afflige la vie a son déclin et pour moi son prestige dans le miroir du temps elle perd ses appas plaisir allez chercher l'amour et la jeunesse laissez-moi ma tristesse et ne l'insultez pas could m de fontaine have felt an antipathy to anything it must have been to my manner of writing in me there began a complete revolution in french literature with the school called the romantic my friend however instead of rising in rebellion against my barbarism became a passionate admirer i noticed great admiration in his face when i read to him portions of my natchez atala and rene he found it impossible to reduce these productions to the common rules of criticism but he felt that he was entering into a new world he saw a new nature and comprehended a language which he was unable to speak i received excellent advice from him and to him i am indebted for all that is correct in my style he taught me to respect the ear he prevented me from falling into the extravagance of invention and the harshness of execution of my imitators it was a great pleasure to me to see him again in london fated by the emigres he was asked for cantos from la grèce sauvée and they pressed round in order to listen to him he took a lodging near me and we never quitted each other more we were present together at a scene worthy of those times of misfortune Clary, just lately landed, read us his manuscript memoir, judge of the emotions of an auditory of exiles, listening to Louis the Sixteenth's valet de chambre, relating, as an eyewitness, the sufferings and death of the prisoner of the temple. The directory, afraid of the effects of Clary's memoirs, 
published an interpolated edition of them, in which the author was made to speak like a lackey, and Louis the Sixteenth like a porter. Among all the examples of revolutionary baseness, this perhaps is one of the foulest. A Vendean peasant. M. Dutay, the Count d'Artois' agent in London, hastened to inquire for M. de Fontaine. The latter begged me to take him to the agent's house. We found him surrounded by all the defenders of the throne and the altar, who lounged about in Piccadilly, by a crowd of spies and pickpockets, who had escaped from Paris under different names and different disguises, and with a host of Belgian, German and Irish traders in the counter-revolution. In a corner of the crowd stood a man about thirty or thirty-two years of age, to whom no one paid attention, and who himself paid attention to nothing except an engraving of the death of General Wolfe. Struck with his appearance, I made some inquiries concerning him. One of my neighbours replied, He's nothing, merely a Vendean peasant, the bearer of a letter from his chiefs. This man, who was nothing, had seen the death of Catalino, the first general of La Vendée, and a peasant like himself, of Vonchamp, the revived image of Bayard, of Lescure, armed with hair-cloth, not proof against balls, of Delbay, shot in his armchair, his wounds preventing him from embracing death standing, of La Roche Jacqueline, the identification of whose dead body was ordered by the patriots in order to calm the fears of the convention in the midst of their victories. This man, who was nothing, had been present at the capture and recapture of two hundred towns, villages, and redoubts, at seven hundred skirmishes, and in seventeen pitched battles. He had fought against three hundred thousand regular troops, between six hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand conscripts and national guards. He had helped to carry off a hundred pieces of cannon and fifty thousand stand of arms. He had passed through the Colonne Infernal, companies of incendiaries commanded by conventionists. He had been in the midst of that ocean of flame, which on three different occasions rolled its waves over the woods of La Vendée, and finally he had seen three hundred thousand rural Herculeses, the companions of his labours, perish, and a hundred square leagues of fertile country changed into a desert of ashes. Old and young France met on this soil thus levelled by them. All that remained in France of the blood and remembrances of the Crusades struggled against all that there was in revolutionary France of new blood and new hopes. The conqueror was sensible of the greatness of the vanquished. Touro, the Republican general, declared that the Vendeans would be placed in history in the first ranks of a martial people. Another general wrote to Melun de Thionville, Troops which have beaten the French may well flatter themselves with being able to beat all other people. The legions of Probus in their songs said as much of our forefathers. Bonaparte called the battles of La Vendée battles of giants. In all this clamorous mob I was the only one to look with admiration and respect on the representative of those old Jacques, who in the reign of Charles V, whilst in the very act of shaking off the yoke of their feudal superiors, repelled a foreign invasion. He appeared to me like a son of those communes of the time of Charles VII, who, united with the lower nobility of the province, reconquered the soil of France foot by foot and ridge by ridge. He had the careless air of a savage. His look was grim and inflexible as a bar of iron. His lower lip quivered against his closed teeth. His hair fell from his head like torpid serpents, but ready to resume their vigour. His arms, hanging by his sides, gave a nervous motion to his immense fists, covered with sabre-scars. He might have been taken for a sawyer. His countenance was that of an honest rustic nature, by the force of circumstances, put to the service of interests and ideas contrary to that nature. The native feudality of the vassal and the simple faith of the Christian were mingled in him with the rude independence of a plebeian accustomed to estimate and to do himself justice. The feeling of liberty seemed in him to be the consciousness of the power of his hands and of the intrepidity of his heart. He spoke no more than a lion, he scratched himself like a lion, gaped like a lion, threw himself on his side like a tired lion, and apparently to dream of blood and forests. What men of all parties were the French of that day, and what a race are we now! But the Republicans had their principle within them, in the midst of them, while that of the Royalists lay out of France. The Vendeans sent deputies to the exiles, the giants sent to our chiefs from the pygmies. The rustic messenger at whom I gazed had seized the revolution by the throat and exclaimed, Come in, go behind me. It shall do you no harm, it shall not move a step. I have got it fast. No one wished to enter. Then Jacques Bonhomme let go his hold of the revolution, 
and Charette broke his sword. Wales with Fontaine. Whilst I was making these reflections on the sturdy Vendéen, as I had made those of another kind at the sight of Mirabeau and Danton, Fontaine obtained a private audience of him whom he pleasantly called the Controller General of Finance. He came out well satisfied with his interview. M. Dutte had given him a promise to encourage the publication of my works, and Fontaine thought only of me. There could not be a better man. Timid in everything which related to himself, but full of courage under the impulse of friendship, of this he gave me the best proof at the time of my resignation, on the occasion of the death of the Duc d'Anguin. In conversation he used to burst out into laughable fits of literary passion. On politics he talked nonsense. The crimes of the conventionalists had filled him with a feeling of horror for liberty. He detested journals, philosophizing and ideology, and imparted the same feeling to Bonaparte in his intercourse with the master of Europe. We often went to walk together in the country. We used to stop under the shade of some of those large elms scattered about in the fields. Leaning against the trunk of one of these trees, my friend used to give me an account of his former travels in England before the revolution, and of the verse which he at that time addressed to two young ladies, now mouldering under the shadow of the towers of Westminster, towers which he found standing as he had left them, whilst the illusions and hours of his youth lay buried at their base. We used to dine in some quiet tavern at Chelsea on the Thames, and enjoyed ourselves with conversing on Milton and Shakespeare. They had seen what we saw. They had sat where we sat on the banks of the river, to us a foreign, but to them a native stream. We returned to London at night by the light of the fading stars, obscured one after another by the haze of the city. We regained our home, guided by the uncertain light which feebly traced out the way through the thickness of the smoke, coloured of a reddish hue around each lamp. Thus flows on the poet's life. We visited London in detail, as an old exile, I acted as cicerone to the new victims of exile, young or old, which the revolution demanded. There is no legal age for misfortune. During one of these excursions we were overtaken by a violent thunderstorm, and obliged to seek for shelter in a shabby house, the door of which happened accidentally to be open. We there met the Duc de Bourbon. At this Chantilly I saw for the first time a prince who was not yet the last of the Condes. The Duc de Bourbon, Fontaine and myself, were equally proscribed, and in a foreign land obliged to seek for shelter under an humble roof, against the same storm, fata viam invenient. Fontaine was called back to France. He embraced me with eager wishes for our next and early meeting. When he reached Germany, he wrote me the following letter. July 28, 1798. If you have felt any regret at my departure from London, I assure you mine has not been less real. You are the second person in whom, during the whole course of my life, I have met with an imagination and a heart completely to my taste. I shall never forget the consolation which I have derived from you during my exile in a foreign land. My dearest and most constant thoughts since I took leave of you turn upon the Natchez. What you read to me, especially very lately, is admirable, and will never leave my memory. But the charm of all the poetical ideas with which you impressed me immediately fled on my arrival in Germany. The most dreadful news from France have followed those with which I made you acquainted on leaving you. I have been kept for five or six days in the most harassing anxiety, in dread even of persecutions against my family. My fears are to-day greatly diminished. The evil has been but very slight, the threat greater than the blow, and the exterminators wish for people of a different date from mine. The last courier has brought me assurance of peace and goodwill. I can continue my journey, and I propose to set out early in the ensuing month. My abode will be fixed near the forest of Saint-Germain, among my family, Greece and my books, would I could also say the Natchez. The unexpected storm which has just burst upon Paris has been caused, I am certain, by the blunders of the agents and chiefs with whom you are acquainted. I have a clear proof of it in my hands. On coming to this conclusion I wrote to Great Pulteney Street, where M. Dutte lived, with all possible politeness, but also with all that circumspection which prudence demands. I wish to avoid all correspondence, at least just now, and I remain in the greatest doubt what I ought to do, and what place of sojourn I ought to choose. I still speak of you with the accents of friendship, and wish from the bottom of my heart that any hopes of usefulness which may rest upon me may serve to keep alive those kindly feelings which have been ascribed to me, and which are so fully due to your person and your distinguished talents. Work. 
work my dear friend become illustrious and you can do so the future belongs to you i hope the promise so often made by the controller general of finance has been at least in part kept that part consoles me for i cannot bear the idea of a fine work being stopped for want of some pecuniary aid write to me let our hearts communicate and our muses be always friends be assured that as soon as i can go about freely in my native land i shall prepare for you a hive and flowers beside my own my attachment is unalterable i shall be alone as long as i am not near you tell me about your studies i wish to congratulate you on completing your work i have composed the half of a new poem on the banks of the elbe and i am more satisfied with it than with all the others adieu i embrace you tenderly and remain your friend fontan fontan informs me that he is composing verses on changing his exile a poet never can be deprived of everything he carries his lyre along with him leave the swan her wings every evening some unknown river will repeat the melodious lamentations which she would rather have sung on the eurotas the future is yours did fontan here speak truly ought i to congratulate myself on his prediction alas the future there announced is now become the past shall i have another the first and affecting letter which i ever received from the first friend whom i had in my life and who since the date of that letter has walked twenty-three years by my side gives me mournful warning of my progressive isolation fontan is no more deep sorrow for the tragical death of a son brought him to an early grave almost all those of whom i have spoken in these memoirs have disappeared from the stage of life and i keep merely an obituary register yet a few years and i myself condemned to catalogue the dead shall leave no one behind to inscribe my name in the book of the departed but if i must remain alone and none who love me shall survive to conduct me to my last asylum i have still less need than others of a guide i have examined the way and studied the places through which i must pass i have desired to see what takes place at the last moment oftentimes standing by the side of a grave into which the coffin has been let down by cords i have listened to the rattling of these cords then came the sound of the first shovelful of earth thrown upon the coffin at every succeeding cast the hollow sound diminished and the earth in filling up the grave by degrees caused eternal silence to ascend to the surface of the tomb fontan you have written may our muses be always friends to me you have not written in vain End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty seven london april to september eighteen twenty two death of my mother return to religion Aliqua audiero nunquam tua verbo loquentem nunquam ego te vita frater amabilio aspiciam post hac at certe semper amabo shall i speak to thee no more shall i never hear thy words shall i never see thee o oh, brother dearer than my life ah i shall ever love thee i have just lost a friend and am about to lose a mother the verses addressed by catullus to his brother are constantly applicable in our valley of tears as in the infernal regions there is the constant murmur of an eternal plaint forming the groundwork or principal note of human lamentations it never ceases and would continue should all created griefs be silent a letter from julie which i received a short time after that from fontaine confirms my sad remark on my progressive isolation fontaine urged me to work to become distinguished my sister begged me to give up writing altogether the one proposed fame to me the other oblivion you have seen in madame de farcy's history that such was the tendency of her ideals she had conceived a hatred to literature because she regarded it as one of the temptations of her life saint Servan, july first seventeen ninety three my brother we have just lost the best of mothers it is with sorrow that i announce this severe blow when you cease to be the object of our solicitude we shall have ceased to live if you knew how many tears your errors have caused our dear mother to shed how deplorable they appear to any one of a thinking mind to any one who lays claim not only to piety but to reason if you knew this it would perhaps help to open your eyes to make you give up writing 
and should heaven touched by our prayers permit us to meet again you would find amongst us all the happiness that can be enjoyed on earth and you would bring happiness to us since none exists for us while you are absent and while we have reason to be uneasy on your account ah why did i not follow the impulse of my heart why did i continue to write had my writings never come to light would there have been any difference in the events or spirit of the century i had then lost my mother and i had embittered her last hour while she with her last breath was uttering a prayer for her only remaining son what was that son doing in london i was perhaps taking a walk on a fresh morning while the death damp was on my mother's brow and my hand was not there to wipe it away the filial tenderness which i had always preserved for madame de chateaubriand was very profound my childhood and youth were intimately associated with my mother's image all that i knew i had learned from her the idea of having poisoned the last days of her who had given me life threw me into despair i flung the copies of the essay with horror into the fire as the instruments of my crime if it had been in my power to annihilate the work i would have done it without hesitation i did not recover from this distracted state of mind until the thought occurred to me that i might expiate this first work by one of a religious character such was the origin of the genie du christianisme my mother i said in the first preface to this work after having been thrown at the age of seventy-two into a dungeon where she witnessed the death of some of her children expired at length on a pallet to which her misfortunes had consigned her the thought of my errors greatly embittered her last days and on her deathbed she charged one of my sisters to reclaim me to the religion in which i had been educated my sister communicated my mother's last wish to me when this letter reached me in my exile my sister herself was no more she too had sunk beneath the effects of her imprisonment these two voices coming as it were from the grave the dead interpreting the dead had a powerful effect on me i became a christian i did not indeed yield to any great supernatural light my conviction came from the heart i wept and believed i exaggerated my fault the essay was not an impious book but a book of doubt and grief through the darkness of this work still gleams a ray of the christian light which beamed on my cradle no great effort was needed to return from the scepticism of the essay to the certainty of the genie du christianisme End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty eight london april to september eighteen twenty two genie du christianisme letter from the chevalier de panat when after the sad news of my mother's death i made a resolve instantly to change my course the title genie du christianisme which immediately occurred to me inspired me i set myself to the work and laboured with the ardour of a son erecting a mausoleum to his mother my materials had long since been collected and blocked out by my previous studies i was better acquainted with the writings of the fathers than people are in the present day i had studied them with the intention of combating them and having entered on the path with evil designs instead of vanquishing i had been vanquished as regarded history properly so called it had been the especial object of my attention during the composition of the essay sur les revolutions the camden papers which i had just been engaged in examining had rendered me familiar with the manners and institutions of the middle ages and finally my terrible manuscript of the natchez of two thousand three hundred and ninety three folio pages contained everything i needed in the way of natural descriptions i could draw largely from this source as i had already done in the essay i wrote the first part of the genie du christianisme the messrs dulot who had constituted themselves booksellers to the french emigrant clergy undertook the publication and the first sheets of the first volume were printed the work thus begun in seventeen ninety nine in london was not completed till eighteen o two in paris see its different prefaces a sort of fever preyed on me during the whole time of its composition none but he who has felt it can know what it was to bear atala and rene at one time in the brain the blood and the soul and to have added to the ideas of these twins of passion the labour of composing the other portions of the work the recollection of charlotte mingled as a warning ray with all my thoughts and to crown all the first desire for fame inflamed my heated imagination this desire was the result of filial tenderness 
I longed for fame that it might ascend to my mother's dwelling place, and that the angels might bring her my holy expiation. As one study leads to another, I could not occupy myself with my French researches without taking note of the literature and literary men of the country in which I was living. I was drawn away into other researches. My days and my nights were passed in reading, writing, taking lessons in Hebrew from a learned priest to the Abbe Capelon, consulting librarians and well-informed people, roaming in the fields, indulging in my old habit of reverie, and in receiving and paying visits. If there are such things as retroactive and symptomatic effects of future events, I might have augured the sensation to be caused by the work which was to make a name for me from the turmoil of my spirits and the palpitations of my muse. Some readings aloud of my first sketches serve to enlighten me. These readings are excellent as a mode of instruction, so long as we do not take all the matter of course flatteries for genuine coin. If an author is earnest and sincere, he will quickly discover, by the instinctive impressions of others, the weak points of his work, especially whether it is too long or too short, whether it keeps to, does not complete, or exceeds the proper measure. I find by me a letter from the Chevalier de Panat, containing his opinion on the readings of a work then so unknown. The letter is charming. One would not have thought the positive and mocking spirit of the Chevalier susceptible of thus meddling with poetry. I do not hesitate to give this letter one of the documents of my history, although it is filled with my praises from beginning to end, as if the malicious author had found a pleasure in pouring out his whole ink-bottle over it. Monday. Mon dear, with what an interesting reading have you indulged me this morning! Our religion had reckoned among its defenders great geniuses, illustrious fathers of the church. These giants had wielded all the arms of reasoning with vigour. Incredulity was conquered, but this was not enough. We yet needed to be shown all the charms of this admirable religion. How fitted it is to the human heart, and what splendid pictures it offers to the imagination. Here we have, not the theologian in a school, but the great painter and the feeling man opening to himself a new horizon. Your work was needed, and you were called to produce it. Nature has eminently gifted you with the fine qualities required for this undertaking. You belong to another age. Ah, if truths of sentiment stand first in the order of nature, no one has better felt those of our religion than you. You have overwhelmed the impious with confusion at the very gate of the temple, and introduced delicate minds and feeling hearts into the sanctuary. You remind me of those ancient philosophers, who gave their lessons with their heads adorned with chaplets of flowers, and their hands filled with sweet perfumes. And this is but a feeble image of your mind, so sweet, so pure, so classic. I congratulate myself daily on the happy circumstance which threw me into your society. I cannot forget that it was a kindness done me by Fontaine. I love him the more for it, and my heart will never separate two names, which should be united in the same fame, if Providence ever reopens the gates of our country to us. Chevalier de Panat. The Abbe de Lille also heard some fragments of the work read. He appeared surprised, and shortly after did me the honour to put the prose which had pleased him into verse. He naturalised my wild American flowers in his various French gardens, and put my rather fiery wine to cool in the icy water of his clear fountain. The unfinished edition of the Genie du Christianisme, commenced in London, differed slightly in the order of its subjects, from that published in France. The consular censorship, soon to become imperial, showed itself very touchy on the subject of kings. Their persons, their honour, and their virtue were dear to it beforehand. Fouché's police had already seen the white pigeon, the symbol of Bonaparte's frankness and revolutionary innocence, descend from heaven with a sacred vial. The sincere believers in the republican processions of Lyon obliged me to cut out a chapter entitled The Atheist Kings, and to scatter the paragraphs here and there throughout the work. End of chapter 28Chapter twenty nine of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. By Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, chapter twenty nine. London, April to September, eighteen twenty two. My uncle, Monsieur de Bedet his eldest daughter. Before continuing my literary investigations, I must interrupt them for a moment to take leave of my uncle de Bedet. Alas! It is taking leave of the first joy of my life. Freno non rumorant dies. No rain can stay the flight of days. See the old tombs in old crypts. 
they themselves vanquished by time decayed and without memory having lost their epitaphs they have forgotten even the names of those they enclose i had written to my uncle on the subject of my mother's death he sent me a long letter in answer containing some touching words of regret but three-fourths of his double folio sheet was devoted to my genealogy he especially impressed upon me when i returned to france to seek out the documents and titles of the descent of the bedes entrusted to my brother thus neither exile nor ruin neither the destruction of his dearest friends nor the immolation of louis the sixteenth warned him of the revolution he was still in the days of the states of brittany and the assembly of the nobility this fixity of idea in a man's mind is very striking in the presence as it were of the decay of his bodily powers the flight of his years and the loss of his relations and friends on his return from emigration my uncle de bede retired to dinan where he died within six leagues of montchois without seeing it again my cousin caroline the eldest of my three cousins is still alive she has remained unmarried notwithstanding several respectable proposals made when she was no longer young she writes me ill-spelled letters in which she calls me thou addresses me a chevalier and speaks to me of the good old time in illo tempore she was gifted with fine black eyes and a pretty figure she danced like camargo and thinks she recollects that i was desperately in love with her though in secret i reply to her in the same tone putting on one side after her example my years my honours and my fame yes dear caroline thy chevalier etc etc it must be thirty or five-and-thirty years since we have met heaven be praised for it for truly i know not what we should think of each other if we should happen to meet sweet patriarchal innocent honourable family friendship your age is past we no longer cling to our native soil by a multitude of flowers branches and roots we are born and die separately the living are eager to cast the deceased into the abyss of eternity and to free themselves from the burden of his corpse of the friends some follow the coffin to the church grumbling meanwhile at having their hours and habits deranged others carry their devotion so far as to follow the funeral procession to the cemetery the grave once filled all memory of the dead is effaced you will never return days of religion and tenderness when the son died in the same house in the same great chair and by the same hearth where his father and his grandfather died before him surrounded as they had been with children and grandchildren in tears receiving the last paternal benediction farewell my dear uncle farewell maternal family which is fast disappearing like the other portion of my family farewell my cousin of old times who still love me as you loved me when we listened in company to my good aunt de boitille's doleful history of the hawk or when you were present at the performance of my nurse's vow at the abbey of nazareth if you survive me accept the legacy of gratitude and affection which i here dedicate to you put no faith in the false smile faintly gathering on my lip while i speak of you my eyes i assure you are full of tears end of chapter twenty nine Chapter thirty of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty. London, April to September, eighteen twenty two, revised in February, eighteen forty five. English literature. Decay of the old school historians poets civilians shakespeare my studies carried on in reference to the genie du christianisme had by degrees as i have already said led me to a closer investigation of english literature when i took refuge in england in seventeen ninety three i found that i must change most of the judgments i had drawn from critiques among the historians hume bore the reputation of a tory and retrograde author he as well as gibbon was accused of having crowded the english language with gallicisms smollett who continued his history was a greater favourite gibbon a philosopher during his life become a christian at his death remained as such impeached and convicted of being a poor man robertson was still spoken of because he was dry as regarded the poets the elegant extract served as an exile for some pieces of dryden pope's rhymes found no pardon although people visited his house at twickenham and cut pieces from the weeping willow planted by his hand and withered as his fame 
Blair was looked upon as a tiresome critic à la Française. He ranked much below Johnson. As to the old spectator, he was laid on the shelf. The English works on politics have little interest for us. Those on political economy are less circumscribed. The calculations on the wealth of nations, the employment of capital, and the balance of trade are in some degree of European application. Burke sprang from the national political individuality. In declaring himself an opponent of the French Revolution, he drew his country into that long career of hostilities which ended on the field of Waterloo. Still some majestic figures remained. Everywhere one met with Milton and Shakespeare. Did Montmorency, Biron, Sui, successively ambassadors from France, at the courts of Elizabeth and James I, ever hear of a strolling player acting in his own farces and in those of others? Did they ever pronounce the name so barbarous in French of Shakespeare? Did they suspect that there was in this name a glory before which their honours, their pomp and their rank would sink into insignificance? The actor playing the ghost in Hamlet was the great phantom, the shade of the Middle Ages, rising above the world like the star of night, at the moment when those Middle Ages had nearly disappeared among the dead, stupendous centuries, opened by Dante and closed by Shakespeare. In his Memorials of English Affairs, Whitelock, who was a contemporary of the author of Paradise Lost, speaks of him as a certain blind man called Milton, Latin secretary to the Council of State. Moliere, the buffoon, played his own poor Sonia, and Shakespeare, the mountebank, made grimaces in his own Falstaff. These disguised travellers, who come from time to time to sit down at our table, are treated like common guests. We remain ignorant of their nature till the time of their disappearance. As they leave this world they are transformed, and say to us, as the angels said to Tobit, I am one of the seven spirits who stand continually in the presence of the Lord. But if they are mistaken by men in their passage, these divinities never mistake one another. Milton felt sure that, sweet as Shakespeare, fancy's child, had no need of monuments in marble and brass to consecrate his venerated bones. Michelangelo, envying the lot and genius of Dante, exclaims, Pour fussio tal, per l'aspro esilio, suo conserva tutte, dare del mondo più felice stato. Would I had been such as he. I would have given all the happiness of the world for his bitter exile, together with his genius. Tasso celebrated Camoens when he was still almost unknown, and contributed to his renown. There is nothing more worthy of admiration than this society of illustrious equals, mutually revealing themselves by the signs of their genius, addressing themselves to and conversing with one another in a language understood by themselves alone. Was Shakespeare lame, like Lord Byron, Walter Scott, and the prayers, prières, the daughters of Jupiter? If it was so in reality, the boy of Stratford, far from being ashamed of his infirmity, like the author of Child Harold, never hesitated to recall it to the mind of one of his mistresses, lame by fortune's dearest spite. Shakespeare must have had many love affairs, if we may reckon one for every sonnet. The creating genius of Desdemone and Juliet must have grown old without any cessation of his attachments. Were the unknown women to whom he addressed his immortal verses proud and happy at being the objects of the poet's sonnets? It may be doubted. Glory is to an old man what diamonds are to an old woman. They adorn, but cannot embellish her. The great dramatist wrote to his mistress in the following strain, No longer mourn for me when I am dead. Then you shall hear the surly, sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it. For I love you so, that I in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe. Oh, if, I say, you look upon this verse, when I perhaps compounded am with clay, do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love ever with my life decay. Shakespeare loved, but he believed no more in love than he did in any other thing. A woman in his eyes was like a bird, a breath of wind, a flower, something which delights and fleets away. From indifference to or ignorance of his fame, from his station, which kept him apart from society or placed him beyond the reach of obtaining it, he seemed to regard life as a lightsome leisure hour, as a brief period of sweet enjoyment. In his youth Shakespeare met with some old monks driven out of their convents, who had seen Henry the Eighth, his reforms, destruction of monasteries, his court fools, his wives, mistresses and executioners. When the poet died, Charles I was sixteen years old. Thus, with one hand, Shakespeare had been able to touch the hoary heads that had been threatened by the sword of the last but one of the Tudors, and with the other the brown locks of the second of the Stuarts, 
which the acts of the parliamentarians was destined to bring to the dust resting upon these tragic supporters the great tragedian went down to the tomb he filled the interval of the days in which he lived with his spectres his blind kings the punishment of ambitious aspirers and women in misfortune in order by analogous fictions to connect the realities of the past with the realities of the future shakespeare is one of five or six writers who satisfy all the wants of the mind and furnish aliment to thought these maternal geniuses seem to have brought forth and reared all the others homer impregnated antiquity aeschylus sophocles euripides aristophanes horace and virgil are his sons dante was the parent of modern italy from petrarch to tasso rabelais was the creator of french literature montaigne la fontaine and moliere were his descendants england is all shakespeare and even down to the latest times he has lent his language to byron and his dialogue to walter scott the claims of these supreme masters are often denied men are guilty of rebellion against them their defects are reckoned up they are accused of ennui tediousness extravagance and bad taste even while men are engaged in plundering them and adorning themselves with their spoils everything springs from them their impress is everywhere to be seen they invent words and names which go to swell the general vocabulary of the people their expressions become proverbs their fictitious personages are formed into real ones who have heirs and lineage they open up horizons from whence issue forth pencils of light they sow ideas which are the germs of thousands of others they furnish conceptions subjects and styles to all the arts their works are the minds or the exhaustless treasures of the human mind such geniuses occupy the first rank their immensity their variety their fertility their originality cause them from the first to be regarded as laws examples moulds types of different intelligences as there are four or five races of men from the same stock of which the rest are merely branches let us beware of insulting the irregularities into which these powerful beings sometimes fall let us not bring upon ourselves the curse of ham let us not laugh should we find the sole and solitary mariner of the deep naked and asleep under the shade of the stranded ark on the mountains of armenia let us respect this diluvian navigator who bore the seeds of a new creation after the cataracts of heaven were exhausted pious children blessed by our father let us cover him modestly with our mantle shakespeare while living never thought of living after his life what are my songs of admiration to him now admitting every supposition and reasoning after the truths or errors with which the human mind is penetrated or imbued what to shakespeare is a renown the fame of which can never ascend to him if a christian in the full enjoyment of the happiness of the eternal world would he be affected by the nothingness of the present if a deist disencumbered of the shades of matter and lost in the splendour of god would he humble himself to cast a glance upon the grain of sand whence he has passed if an atheist he sleeps the sleep without breathing or wakening which is called death nothing is more vain than glory beyond the tomb unless it has given life to friendship been useful to virtue lent seasonable aid to misfortune and it be granted to us in heaven to enjoy the consoling generous and merciful idea left by us on the earth end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty one london from april till september eighteen twenty two novels old and new richardson walter scott at the close of the last century novels had fallen under general prescription richardson slept forgotten his countrymen fancied they could detect in his style traces of the society in which he had moved fielding kept his place well stern the upholder of originality was out of fashion the vicar of wakefield was still read if richardson is deficient in style his works will not survive because an author's fame depends upon style alone it is vain to rebel against this truth the best written works filled with portraitures of great truthfulness and with a thousand other good qualities will perish if they are deficient in style style and there are a thousand kinds cannot be learned it is the gift of heaven a natural endowment but if richardson has fallen into disrepute merely in consequence of a certain vulgar phraseology 
intolerable to refined society, his works will live again. The revolution which is in progress, by abasing the aristocracy and raising up the middle classes, will render the traces of the lower class of society and their exclusive language less perceptible or make them wholly disappear. Clarissa Harlow and Tom Jones are the sources from whence have sprung the two principal branches of the family of modern English novels, the novels of family life and domestic scenes, and those of invention and delineations of general society. After the time of Richardson, the manners of high life made an eruption into the domain of fiction. Novels were then filled with castles, lords, ladies, water parties, scenes on the race-course, at the ball, the opera, at Rainley, with chit-chat and endless loquacity. The scene was not long in changing to Italy. Lovers crossed the Alps in the midst of fearful perils and horrors of soul enough to melt lions. The lions shed tears. The jargon of good society was adopted. Among the thousands of novels with which England has been inundated for half a century past, two have kept their ground, Caleb Williams and The Monk. I never met with Godwin during my exile in London, but saw Lewis twice. He was a young member of Parliament, very agreeable, and had all the air and manners of a Frenchman. The writings of Mrs. Radcliffe form a species of themselves. Those of Mrs. Barbel, Miss Edgeworth, Miss Burney, etc., have, it is said, a chance of living. There ought, says Montaigne, to be laws of coercion passed against silly and useless scribblers, as there are laws against vagabonds and idlers, such as I am, and a hundred others, would be banished from the hands of our people. Scribbling seems to be one of the symptoms of a dissolute age. All those different schools of novelists, whether sedentary or travellers by diligence or post, novelists of lakes and mountains, of ruins and phantoms, or novelists of cities and drawing-rooms, have, however, now all perished in the new school of Walter Scott, just as poetry has gone headlong after the steps of Lord Byron. The illustrious Scotch writer made his debut on the theatre of literature at the time of my exile in London, by a translation of Goethe's Goethe von Berlichingen. He continued to gain reputation by his poetry, and the bent of his inclination led him at length to the novel. He appears to me to have created a false species. He has perverted both the novel and history. The novelist has tried to write historical novels, and the historian to embellish histories. If, in reading Walter Scott, I am often obliged to pass by interminable conversations, it is doubtless my fault. But in my eyes, one of his great merits is that his writings may be put into every one's hands. It demands much greater efforts of ability to interest while keeping within the limits of order than to please by passing beyond its bounds. It is less easy to regulate the heart than to disturb it. Burke kept English politics in the past. Walter Scott carried the English back again to the Middle Ages. All that he wrote, made and built, was Gothic. Books, furniture, houses, churches, and castles. But the lairds of Magna Carta are now the fashionables of Bond Street, a frivolous race, who reside in their ancient mansions, waiting the arrival of new generations, who are preparing to drive them out. Recent Poetry. Beatty. At the same time in which the novel became romantic, poetry underwent a similar transformation. Cooper abandoned the French school in order to revive the national one. Burns began the same revolution in Scotland. After them came the restorers of ballad poetry. Several of these poets, from the years 1792 till 1800, belonged to what was called the Lake School, because these writers lived on the shores of the Cumberland and Westmoreland lakes, and sometimes celebrated their beauties. Moore, Campbell, Rogers, Crabb, Wordsworth, Hunt, Knowles, Lord Holland, Canning, and Croker, are still alive for the honour of English literature. But a man must be English-born, duly to appreciate the merits of a peculiar species of composition, which comes home to those alone who are natives of the soil. In a living literature, no one is a competent judge except of works written in his own language. It is vain to hope for a thorough feeling of a foreign idiom. The nurse milk is wanting, as well as the first words which have been learnt while in our swaddling clothes. Certain tones can only belong to fatherland. Of all our men of letters, the English and the Germans have the most extraordinary notions. They admire what we despise, they despise what we admire, they neither understand Racine, nor La Fontaine, nor even Moliere completely. It makes one laugh to hear who are our great writers. In London, Vienna, Berlin, Petersburg, Munich, Leipzig, Göttingen, and Cologne, to hear what people read with a rage, and what do they not read at all? When the merit of an author consists especially in diction, a stranger never can form an accurate estimate of this beauty. The more his powers are individual and national, 
the more his mysteries escape a mind which is not, so to speak, a fellow countryman of their talents. We admire the Greeks and Romans upon tradition. We derive this admiration from authority, and the Greeks and Romans are no longer here to scoff at the opinions of us barbarians. Which of us can form any adequate idea of the harmony of Demosthenes and Cicero's prose, of the musical cadences of Alceus and Horace, as these were seized upon and felt by a Greek and Latin ear? It has been mentioned that real beauties are those of all times and all countries. Yes, beauties of sentiment and thought, but not beauties of style. Style is not, like thought, a cosmopolite. It has a native land, a climate and sun of its own. Burns, Mason and Cooper died during my exile in London, before and during 1800. They closed the century. I commenced it. Darwin and Beattie died two years after my return to France. Beattie announced the new era of lyrics. The minstrel, or the progress of genius, is a description of the first influence of the muse upon a young bard, still ignorant of the power with which he is tormented. At one time, the future poet goes and sits down upon the seashore during a storm. At another, he leaves the village sports to listen apart, in the distance, to the sound of the bagpipe. Beatty has run through the whole series of dreams and melancholy ideas, of which other poets have believed themselves to be the discoverers. Beatty proposed to himself to continue his poem, and he has, in fact, written a second canto. Edwin, one evening, hears a grave voice proceeding from the depths of a valley. It was that of a hermit, who, after having seen the vanities and illusions of the world, had buried himself in this retreat to study the inward life of his own soul, and celebrate the wonders of the Creator. This hermit instructs the young minstrel, and reveals to him the secret of his genius. The idea was a happy one. The execution was far from equal to the conception. Beatty was destined to shed tears. The death of his son crushed his heart. Like a sheen after the loss of Oscar, he hung up his harp on the branches of an oak. Perhaps Beatty's son was that young minstrel of whom a father had sung, and whose steps he no longer saw on the mountains. End of chapter 31《ラプトゥ32の『シャトーブリオン』1768-1800 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 3, by François-René de Chateaubriand. Chapter 32 London from April till September, 1822. Lord Byron. In Lord Byron's poetry, striking imitations of the minstrel are to be found. At the time of my exile in England, Lord Byron was at school at Harrow, a village ten miles from London. He was a boy, I too was young, and as much unknown as he. He had been brought up amongst the heaths of Scotland, on the sea coast, as I had been on the land of Brittany, bordering the ocean. He at first delighted in the Bible and Achim, as I loved them. In Newstead Abbey he sang the remembrances of his youth, as I recorded mine in the Chateau of Combourg. In my excursions about the neighbourhood of London, at the time when I was so unhappy, I have twenty times passed through the village of Harrow without having any idea of the genius which it contained. I have sat in the cemetery at the foot of the elm under which, in 1807, Lord Byron wrote the following lines, at the very time of my return from Palestine. How do thy branches, moaning to the blast, invite the bosom to recall the past, and seem to whisper as they gently swell, take while thou canst a lingering last farewell, when fate shall chill at length this fevered breast, and calm its cares and passions into rest, oft have I thought twould soothe my dying hour, if aught may soothe when life resigns her power, to know some humble grave, some narrow cell, would hide my bosom where it loved to dwell, with this fond dream methinks to sweet to die, and here it lingered, here my heart may lie. Here might I sleep, where all my hopes arose, scenes of my youth and couch of my repose, etc., etc. And I too say hail, venerable elm, at the foot of which Byron, when a boy, gave free scope to the fancies of his age, when I also was dreaming of René under thy shade, under the very same shade where the English poet came at a later period to dream of Child Harold. Byron asked of the burying place which was the witness of the sports of his early life, an humble grave, a useless request, which renown will never grant. 
Byron, however, is no longer what he was. When living at Venice, I met with his name everywhere. In the very same city, some years afterwards, his name was blotted out from memory, and nowhere known. It was no longer repeated by the echoes of the Lido, and if you asked the Venetians about him, they knew not of whom you spoke. With respect to them, Lord Byron is dead. They no longer hear the neighing of his horse. The case is the same in London, where his memory is dying out. Such is the lot of men. If it happened to me frequently to pass through Harrow, without knowing that it was then the abode of the boy Lord Byron, Englishmen have passed through Combourg without suspecting that a little truant, brought up in its woods, would ever leave a trace of himself. Arthur Young, in his farmer's tour through France, Spain, and Italy, has thus described Combourg. To Combourg, the country has a savage aspect, husbandry not much further advanced, at least in skill, than among the Hurons, which appears incredible amidst enclosures, the people almost as wild as their country, and their town of Combourg, one of the most brutal, filthy places that can be seen, mud houses, no windows, and a pavement so broken as to impede all passengers but ease none. Yet here is a chateau, and inhabited, who is this Monsieur de Chateaubriand, the owner, that has nerves strung for a residence amid such filth and poverty? Below this hideous heap of wretchedness is a fine lake, surrounded by well-wooded enclosures. Volume 2, page 83. This Monsieur de Chateaubriand was my father. The retreat which appeared so horrible to the agriculturist in an ill humour was, notwithstanding, a noble and beautiful residence, although somewhat heavy and sombre. As for myself, I was then but a feeble plant of ivy, just beginning to climb those rude towers. And how could Mr. Young, whose attention was wholly engaged with our harvests, have been able to perceive me? Let me here be allowed to add to those remarks written in England in 1822, some others written in 1814 and 1840. These will finish my notice of Lord Byron, or rather this notice will be complete, when my readers see what I again say of the great poet on my visiting venice there may be perhaps some interest in observing hereafter the concurrence of the two chiefs of the new french and english schools exhibiting so great a similarity in their ideas and destinies if not in their manners the one a peer of england the other a peer of france both travellers in the east the one often close upon the other without their ever having actually met the only difference is that the life of the english poet has been mixed up with events far less important than mine. Lord Byron went after me to visit the ruins of Greece. In Child Harold he seems to embellish with his own colours the descriptions of the itinéraire. At the commencement of my pilgrimage I reproduced the Sire de Joinville's farewell to his chateau. Byron addressed a similar farewell to his Gothic halls. In the Martyrs, Eudorus set out from Messenia to go to Rome. Our voyage, says he, was long. We saw all the promontories remarkable for their temples or tombs. My young companions had never heard anything spoken of except the metamorphoses of Jupiter, and knew nothing of the ruins passing before their eyes. For myself, I had already sat with the prophet on the ruins of cities waste and desolate, and Babylon taught me the history and fate of Corinth. The English poet, as well as the French prosaist, had been anticipated by the letter of Sulpicius to Cicero, a concurrence so perfect is to me singularly glorious, seeing that I preceded the immortal bard to the shores of which we have preserved the same recollections, and of which we have commemorated the same ruins. I have further the honour of being in accord with Lord Byron, in that my letter on the Campania possessed the inestimable advantage of having anticipated the inspirations of a renowned genius. The early translators, commentators, and admirers of Lord Byron have been careful to avoid pointing out that some passages of my works might have remained for a moment in the recollection of the author of Child Harold. They perhaps suppose that such a remark would have robbed his genius of some of its creative power. Now, however, that the enthusiasm has subsided a little, they are less niggardly of doing me this honour. Our immortal Béranger, in the last volume of his songs, has said, In one of the couplets which precede this, I refer to the liars which France owes to François de Chateaubriand. I have no fear of this being gainsaid by the new school of poetry, which, being born under the wings of the eagle, has often, and with reason, boasted of such an origin. The influence of the author of the Génie du Christianisme has been no less felt in other countries, and it would perhaps be any justice to acknowledge that the right of Child Harold is of the family of René. 
In an excellent article on Lord Byron, M. Villemain has repeated Béranger's remark. Some incomparable passages of René, says he, had, it is true, exhausted this poetical character. I know not whether Byron imitated them or reproduced them by his genius. What I have just said upon the affinities of imagination and destiny between the chronicler of René and the author of Charles Harold does not pluck away a single hair from the head of the immortal bard. What could my prosaic and humble muse avail the muse of the dee with the lyre and wings? Lord Byron will live, whether as the child of his generation, like myself, he has expressed, like me, its passions and misfortunes, as Goethe did before us, or whether the course and the lights of my garlic bark have been the guides of the bark of Albion on unknown seas. Besides, two minds of a similar bent may very well have similar ideas, without there being any ground for approaching either with servile imitation of the other. It is quite permissible to avail ourselves of ideas and imagery expressed in a foreign language, in order to enrich our own. This is a thing acknowledged in all ages and at all times. I am conscious that in my youth I was indebted for many of my ideas to Achine, Werther, Les Herveries d'un Promeneur Solitaire, and Les Etudes de la Nature. But I have never concealed anything, nor dissembled the pleasure which I derived from the works in which I delighted. If it be true that René formed an element in the essence of that single personage, introduced under different names in Charles Harold, Conrad, Lara, Manfred, and the Jar, if perchance Lord Byron had imparted to me life from his life, would he then have had the weakness never to name me? Was I then one of those fathers who is denied as soon as one attains to power? Could Lord Byron, who quotes almost all the French contemporary authors, have been completely ignorant of me? Had he never heard me spoken of when the English as well as the French journals had been filled for twenty years with controversies upon my works? When the New Times drew a comparison between the writer of the Génie du Christianisme and the author of Child Harold. There is no mind, however highly favoured it may be, which has not its peculiar susceptibility and distrust. A man wishes to retain the sceptre, fears to divide the sway, and is angry at comparisons. Thus another superior genius has altogether omitted my name in a work on literature. Thanks to God that, estimating myself at my just value, I have never made any pretensions to empire, as I believe in religious truth alone, of which liberty is a form. I have no more faith in myself than in anything else here below, but I have never felt the need of keeping silence when I really admire. For this reason I proclaim my admiration of Madame de Steele and Lord Byron. What is more delightful than admiration? It partakes of heavenly law, of tenderness exalted even to veneration. We feel ourselves filled with gratitude to the divinity which extends the powers of our minds, opens new views to our souls, and confers upon us a happiness so great and so pure without any admixture either of envy or fear. Besides, the petty quarrel which in these memoirs I wage against the greatest poet whom England has seen since Milton proves only one thing, the great value which I would have attached to the notice of his muse. Lord Byron opened a deplorable school. I presume he was as much grieved with the child Harold's, to whom he gave his birth, as I am with the Renés who dream about me. The life of Lord Byron is a subject of much investigation and of many calumnies. The young have taken his magic words as seriously meant. Women have felt disposed to suffer themselves to be seduced with fear by this monster, to console this solitary and unhappy Satan. Who knows? Perhaps he did not find the woman whom he sought, a woman beautiful enough, a heart as large as his own. According to the theory of demoniacal possession, Byron is the old seducing and corrupting serpent, because he sees the corruption of the human race. He is a fated and suffering genius, placed between the mysteries of matter and mind, who finds no word to express the enigma of the universe, who looks upon life as a frightful mockery, without a cause, as a perverse smile of evil. He is the son of despair, whose language is contempt and denial, a man who has not passed through the age of innocence, and who, having come forth reprobate from the bosom of nature, is the damned of annihilation. Such is the Byron of heated imaginations such as it appears to me, is not the man in reality. As in the case of most others, two different men are combined in Lord Byron, the man of nature and the man of training. The poet, perceiving the character which the public gave him to play, accepted it, and began to curse the world, which he had at first only done in his poetic dreams. This course is apparent in the chronological order of his works. As to his genius, far from having the extent attributed to it, it is limited enough, his poetical thoughts are confined to lamentation, complaint, and imprecation. 
in these respects they are admirable we are not to ask the liar what it thinks but what it sings as to his mind it is sarcastic and varied but of a nature which agitates and of evil influence the writer has carefully studied voltaire and imitates him lord byron endowed with every advantage had little reason to reproach his birth the very accident which rendered him unhappy and which linked all his lofty superiority with human infirmity ought not to have tormented him since it did not hinder him from being loved the immortal bard knew from his own experience how true is the maxim of zeno the voice is the flower of beauty how deplorable is the rapidity with which renown flies away at the present day at the end of some years what do i say of some months the public infatuation disappears and reviling succeeds the glory of lord byron already begins to pale his genius is better understood among us and altars will be raised to his honour longer in france than in england as the peculiar excellency of child harold consists in the delineation of individual sentiment and feeling the english who prefer such sentiments as are common to all will end by disowning the poet whose plaint is so deep and sorrowful let them beware if they break the image of the man who has made them live what will they have remaining when i wrote these remarks on lord byron during my exile in london in eighteen twenty two he had only two years of his earthly race to run he died in eighteen twenty four at the very time in which the public disenchantment and a strong feeling of repugnance towards him were about to commence i preceded him in life he has gone before me to the grave he has been called away before his turn my number was before his and nevertheless his was drawn out before mine child harold ought to have remained the world might lose me without perceiving my disappearance in continuing my route i met madame guccioli in rome and lady byron in paris weakness and virtue have thus been presented to me the former had perhaps too much reality and the latter not enough of ideality End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty three london from april till september eighteen twenty two england from richmond to greenwich excursion with pelletier blenheim stowe hampton court oxford eton college manners private and political fox pitt burke george the third having now spoken of english writers at the period when england afforded me an asylum it only remains for me to say something of england itself at that time its scenery castles and manners and customs private as well as political the whole of england may perhaps be seen in the space of a dozen miles from richmond above london to greenwich below it below london lies england industrial and commercial with its docks warehouses custom-house foundries and ships at every tide vessels of all sizes ascend the thames in three divisions the smallest first then those of middle size and finally the large ships whose sails almost touch the columns of greenwich hospital and the windows of its festive taverns above london lies england agricultural and pastoral with its meadows, herds, country houses, and parks, washed by the waters of the Thames, driven back by the tide, and twice in the day bathing their shrubberies and lawns. Between these two opposite points, Richmond and Greenwich, London embraces in itself all the things of this double England. In the west, the aristocracy, in the east, the democracy, the Tower and Westminster, limits between which the entire history of Great Britain has its centre. I passed a part of the summer of 1799 at Richmond with Christian de la Moignon, engaged on the Génie du Christianisme. I enjoyed myself with boating on the Thames and walks in the park. I could have wished that Richmond by London had been Honor Richemundiae, the Richmond of the Treaty, for in that case I should have found myself in my own country again, and thus William the Bastard made a present to Alain, Duke of Brittany, his son-in-law, of 442 lordships in England which afterwards formed the county of Richmond. Alan's successors, the Dukes of Brittany, granted these domains as fiefs to Breton Chevalier, the younger sons of the families of de Rouen, de Tintaniac, de Chateaubriand, de Goyon, and de Montboucher. But in spite of my goodwill, I was obliged to seek in Yorkshire for the county of Richmond, 
erected into a duchy under Charles II, for a bastard. Ridgemill on the Thames is the old sheen of Edward III. At this place, in 1377, died Edward III, that renowned king robbed by his mistress, Alice Pierce, who was no longer the Alice or Catherine of Salisbury of the early years of the victor of Cressy. Do not love except at an age when you can be loved. Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth also died at Richmond. Where do not men die? Henry the Eighth delighted in this palace. English historians are greatly embarrassed with the character of this atrocious man. On the one hand, they cannot dissemble his tyranny and the servility of Parliament. On the other, if they spoke too strongly against the head of the Reformation, they would condemn themselves by condemning him. Plus l'oppresseur est vil, plus l'esclave est infâme. The hill is still in Richmond Park, which served Henry the Eighth as an observatory to obtain intelligence of the execution of Anne Bullen. Henry leapt with joy at sight of the signal from the Tower of London. What a pleasure! The axe had cut in twain the delicate neck and blooded the beautiful hair, which the poet king had clasped in his fatal embrace. In the deserted park of Richmond, I watched for no homicidal signal and should not even have wished the smallest ill to any one who might then have betrayed me. I walked in company with a few peaceable deer. They were accustomed to run before a pack of hounds, to stop when they were tired, and be then brought back, very lively and well pleased with the game, in a cart filled with straw. I went to Kew to see the kangaroos, ridiculous creatures, exactly the inverse of the giraffe. These innocent leaping quadrupeds people the wilds of Australia better than the mistresses of the old Duke of Queensbury people the streets of Richmond. The Thames glided past the lawn of a cottage, half hidden beneath a cedar, and sheltered by weeping willows. A newly married couple had come to spend their honeymoon in this paradise. One evening, while I was sauntering on the greensward at Twickenham, Pelletier made his appearance, holding his handkerchief to his mouth. "'What a villainous perpetual fog!' cried he, as soon as he was within hearing. "'How can you stay here? I have made my list.' Stowe, Blenheim, Hampton Court, Oxford. With your dreaming fashion, you would be in John Bull's land in Vita Materna, and see nothing. In vain I begged to be excused. I was obliged to go. In the carriage, Pelletier gave me a history of his hopes. He had relays of them. If one broke down under him, he bestrode another, and drove on, a leg on this side, a leg on that, to the end of his journey. One of these hopes, the most substantial of the number, conducted him into Bonaparte's suite, he took Napoleon by the collar, and Napoleon was foolish enough to box with him. Pelletier had James Mackintosh for his second. Convicted afterwards on his trial, he made a fresh fortune, which he squandered directly, by selling the writings belonging to the trial. Blenheim was disagreeable to me. I suffered the more from being reminded of an ancient disaster of my country, because the recollection of a recent personal insult was fresh. Some men in a boat up the Thames had seen me on the shore, and perceiving that I was a Frenchman, had begun to shout hurrah news of the naval engagement at abukir had just been received these victories of the foreigner although they might be the means of reopening the gates of france to me were hateful in my eyes nelson whom i had met several times in hyde park buried his victories at naples in the shawl of lady hamilton whilst the lazzaroni played a ball with heads the admiral died gloriously at trafalgar and his mistress miserably at calais having lost beauty, youth, and fortune, and I, whom the triumph of Abukir, thus wounded on the banks of the Thames, have seen the palms of Libya fringing the calm, solitary waters once reddened by the blood of my fellow countrymen. The park at Stowe is celebrated for its various buildings. I preferred shady depths. The Cicerone of the place showed us in a dark ravine the imitation of a temple, the original of which I was one day to see in the brilliant valley of Cephisus. Beautiful paintings of the Italian school were pining in the obscurity of uninhabited chambers with closed shutters. Poor Raphael, thus prisoner in an old English castle, far from the clear sky which smiled above the Farnesina. In Hampton Court was preserved a collection of portraits of the mistresses of Charles II. Such was his prince's course when raised to the throne, after a revolution which had deprived his father of his head and was destined to banish his race. At Slough we saw Herschel, his learned sister, and his great telescope, forty feet long. He was looking out for new planets, at which Pelletier, who kept to the seven old ones, was much amused. We remained two days in Oxford, and I was much pleased with this republic of Alfred the Great. It represented the privileged liberties and manners of learned institutions in the Middle Ages. We hurried through the twenty-five colleges, the libraries, the pictures, the museum, and the botanical garden. I turned over with extreme pleasure among the manuscripts of Worcester College, a life of the Black Prince, 
written in French verse by that prince's herald. Oxford, without resembling them, recalled to my memory the modest colleges of Dole, Rouen, and Dinan. I had translated Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, an imitation of Dante's line, Squilite di lontano che paese il giorno piange che si muore. Pelletier had early sounded the trumpet for my translation in his newspaper. At sight of Oxford, I thought of the same poet's ode on a distant prospect of Eton College. Ah, happy hills, ah, pleasing shade, ah, fields beloved in vain, where once my careless childhood strayed, a stranger yet to pain. I feel the gales that from ye blow, a momentary bliss bestow, as waving fresh their gladsome wing, my weary soul they seem to soothe, and redolent of joy and youth to breathe a second spring. Say, Father Thames, what idle progeny succeed to chase the rolling circle speed, or urge the flying ball? Alas, regardless of their doom, the little victims play, no sense have they of ills to come, nor care beyond to-day. Who has not experienced the feelings and regrets expressed in these lines with all the sweetness of the muse? Who has not been moved at the remembrance of the sports, the studies, the attachments of his early years? But can we bring them again to life? Youthful pleasures revived by memory are like ruins seen by torchlight. Private Life of the English Separated from the continent by a long war, the English at the close of the last century still preserved their national manners and character. There was as yet but one people, in whose name the sovereignty was exercised by an aristocratic government. There were but two great classes known, bound together by friendly feeling and common interest, the patrons and the clients. That jealous class, called bourgeoisie, in France, which is beginning to form in England, did not yet exist. There was nothing intervening between the rich landlords and the men living by their labour. All was not yet machinery in the manufacturing business, and folly in the privileged ranks. On the same pavements, where we now see dirty faces and men in greatcoats, were then to be seen young girls in their white cloaks, and little straw hats tied under the chin with a ribbon, with a basket hanging on their arm in which was fruit or a book, all with downcast eyes and blushing if any one looked at them. England, says Shakespeare, is a nest of swans in the midst of the waters. Frock coats were so little worn in London, in 1793, that a lady, who was weeping hot tears for the death of Louis the Sixteenth, said to me, But dear sir, is it true that the poor king wore a surtout when his head was cut off? The gentlemen farmers had not yet sold their patrimonies in order to live in London. They still formed that independent fraction in the House of Commons, which, in opposition to the ministry, maintained ideas of liberty, order, and property. They hunted foxes or shot pheasants in autumn, ate fat geese at Christmas, cried vivat to roast beef, complained of the present, praised up the past, cursed pit and war, which raised the price of port wine, and went to bed intoxicated, to prepare for passing another day in the same way. They felt quite secure that the glory of Great Britain would never decay as long as God save the King should be sung, the rotten boroughs kept all safe, the game laws remain in vigour, and hares and partridges be furtively sold in the market, under the names of lions and ostriches. The English clergy were learned, hospitable, and generous. They had received their French brethren with true Christian charity. The University of Oxford had a New Testament, according to the Roman Catholic text, printed and distributed to the cures. On the title were inscribed these words, for the use of the Catholic clergy exiled in the cause of religion. As regarded the higher ranks of English society, I, a poor and obscure exile, could see but the outside. On a day of reception at court, or drawing-room of the Princess of Wales. Ladies passed me seated sideways in sedan-chairs, their great hoops projected from the doors like the antipedium of an altar. The ladies themselves, on these altars of enormous hoop petticoats, resemble Madonnas or Pagodas. These fair dames were the daughters of others as fair who had been objects of adoration to the Duc de Guiche and the Duc de Lausanne, and are now, in 1822, the mothers and grandmothers of the young girls who dance in short dresses in my saloons to the music of Collinet, quickly springing generations of flowers. Political Manners England of 1688 was, towards the close of the last century, at the height of her glory. When a poor émigré in London, from 1793 to 1800, I listened to the eloquence of Pitt, Fox, Sheridan, Wilberforce, Grenville, Whitbread, Lauderdale, and Erskine. Now, 
ambassador in the same place, in 1822. I cannot describe my feeling of surprise when, instead of the great orators whom I formerly admired, I see those rise who were their subordinates at the time of my first visit, the scholars in the place of the masters. General ideas have penetrated into this private society. But the enlightened aristocracy which stood at the helm of English affairs for a hundred and forty years, exhibited to the world one of the finest and greatest societies which has done honour to mankind since the days of the Roman patriciate. Perhaps some old family, living retired in one of the counties, will recognise the society which I have just delineated, and regret the time, the loss of which I here deplore. In 1792, Burke separated himself from Fox. Their difference of opinion occurred on the French Revolution, which Burke attacked, and Fox defended. Never did the two orators, who until then had been friends, display so much eloquence. The whole house was affected, and Fox's eyes filled with tears. Burke took an opportunity, on the discussion of the Canadian Bill, to state his decided opinion concerning the revolution in France, and the doctrines maintained by the advocates for that revolution. These doctrines he stigmatised in terms of the greatest severity. He alluded to the unkindness and cruelty of his friend, in endeavouring to libel his life and render him odious. He said he was a willing victim to the good of his country. To the safety of his country he had sacrificed private friendship and party support. He painted the follies, iniquities, cruelties and horrors of the French republicans. He did not consider France as a republic. No, it was an anomaly in government. He knew not by what name to call it. It was a compound of Milton's sublimely obscure and tremendous figure of death. It was a shapeless monster born of hell and chaos. Fox having said that the loss of friends was not a necessary consequence, Burke cried, He said he knew the result of his conduct. He had done his duty at the price of his friend. He warned the honourable gentlemen, who were the two great rivals in the house, whether they moved in the political hemisphere like two great meteors, or in peaceable conjunction like brothers, to preserve and cherish the British constitution, to be on their guard against innovations and to save themselves from the danger of these new theories. Memorable epoch of the world. I became acquainted with Burke in the latter years of his life. Overwhelmed with grief at the death of his only son, he had founded a school for the children of poor emigres. I went with him to see what he called his nursery. He looked on with pleasure at the lively gambols of this little race of strangers, growing up under the paternal care of his genius. On seeing the unconscious exiles leaping, he said to me, Our boys could not do that. And his eyes filled with tears. He was thinking of his son, departed to a longer exile. Pitt, Fox and Burke are no more, and the English constitution has felt the influence of the new theories. An idea of the scene of which I have spoken can only be formed by those who have been witnesses of the weighty debates of Parliament at this period, and have heard the orators whose prophetic voices seem to announce an approaching revolution. Liberty, confined within the bounds of order, seemed to struggle in Westminster against the influence of anarchical liberty, speaking from the yet bloody tribune of the convention. Pitt was tall and thin, with a gloomy, sneering expression. His language was cold, his intonation monotonous, his gestures passionless. Yet the lucidness and fluency of his ideas, and his logical reasoning, illuminated by sudden flashes of eloquence, made his abilities something extraordinary. I saw Pitt pretty often, as he walked across St. James's Park from his house on his way to the King. George the Third, on his side, had perhaps just arrived from Windsor, after drinking beer from pewter pots with the farmers of the neighbourhood, he crossed the ugly courtyards of his ugly palace in a dark carriage, followed by a few horse guards. This was the master of the kings of Europe, as five or six city merchants are masters of India. Pitt, in a black coat and brass-hilted sword, with his hat under his arm, went upstairs two or three steps at a time. On his way he only saw a few idle emigres and glancing disdainfully at us, passed on with a pale face and head thrown back. This great financier maintained no order in his own house. He had no regular hours for his meals or his sleep. Plunged in debt, he paid nothing, and could not make up his mind to add up a bill. A valet managed his household affairs. Ill-dressed, without pleasure, without passions, eager for power alone, he despised honours, and would be nothing but William Pitt. Lord Liverpool took me to dine at his country house in the month of June, 1822, and on the way thither pointed out to me the small house 
where died in poverty the son of Lord Chatham, the statesman who brought all Europe into his pay, and distributed with his own hands all the millions of the earth. George the Third survived Pitt, but he had lost both reason and sight. Every session, at the opening of Parliament, the ministers read to the silent and affected members a bulletin of the King's health. One day I had gone to visit Windsor, and by the gift of a few shillings, persuaded a doorkeeper to hide me where I could have a view of the King. The monarch came with his white hair and sightless eyes, wandering through his palace like King Lear, and feeling his way along the walls. He sat down before a piano whose place he knew, and played some fragments of one of Handel's sonatas, a beautiful end for old England. End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty four london april to september eighteen twenty two return of the emigres to france the Prussian minister gives me a false passport under the name of Lasagne, an inhabitant of Neufchatel in Switzerland, death of Lord Londonderry, end of my career as a soldier and as a traveller, I land at Calais. I began to turn my eyes towards my native country. A great revolution had been effected. Bonaparte having become first consul, re-established order by despotism, many of the exiles returned. The emigres of rank, especially hastened back to recover the wrecks of their fortunes fidelity was perishing at its head while its heart still beat in the breast of a few poor gentlemen of the provinces mrs lindsay had left england and wrote to messieurs de la Mognon to return to their country she also urged their sister madame d'agesseau to come over fontaine wished me to go and finish the publication of the genie du christianisme at paris although my recollection of and affection for my country were fresh and vivid i felt no desire to return to it God's more powerful than the paternal lares kept me back. I had no longer either possessions or a home in France. My country had become to me a bosom of stone, a milkless breast. I should find neither my mother nor my brother, nor my sister Julie there. Lucille was still living, but she had married Monsieur de Caux, and no longer bore my name. My young widow only knew me by a union of a few months, by misfortune, and an absence of eight years. Had I been left entirely to myself, I know not whether I should have had strength of mind to resolve on departure. But I saw my little circle melting away. Madame d'Aguesseau offered to take me to Paris, and I yielded. The Prussian minister procured me a passport under the name of Lasagne, an inhabitant of Neufchatel. Messieurs Gillot stopped the printing of the Genie du Christianisme, and gave me the sheets already printed. I extracted from the Natchez the sketches of Atala and René, locked up the rest of the manuscript in a trunk, which I entrusted to the keeping of my host in London, and set out for Dover, with Madame d'Aguesseau. Mrs. Lindsay was waiting for us at Calais. Thus in the year 1800 I quitted England. My heart was filled with very different thoughts from those which occupy it when I write this in 1822. Then I brought from the land of exile naught but regrets and dreams. Now my head is filled with scenes of ambition, politics, grandeur, and courts, so ill-suited to my nature. What masses of events are, as it were, piled up, in my present existence. Pass on, men, pass on. My turn will come. I have as yet unfolded but a third part of my days to you. If the sufferings which I have endured weighed darkly on my bright early days, now, when entering on a more productive age, the germ of René is about to be developed, and bitterness of another kind will mingle with my narrative. How much shall I have to say in speaking of my country, of its revolutions, of which I have already traced the first sketch? of the empire and its gigantic head, of whose fall I have been a witness, of the restoration in which I took so great a part, glorious now in 1822, but over which there yet seems in my eyes to hover a vague, dark, funereal cloud. I am about to close this chapter, which traces me up to the spring of 1800. Arrived at the end of my first career, there now opens before me the career of the author. From a private individual I am about to become a public man, to quit the pure and silent shelter of solitude for the soiled and noisy highway of the world bright daylight will throw its beams upon my dreamy existence and light penetrate into the kingdom of shadows i look back with emotion on the pages which delineate these hours 
unmarked by action nor event i seem to be bidding a last farewell to my paternal home i take leave of the thoughts and chimeras of my youth as of sisters or lovers whom i leave by the family hearth and shall never see more our passage from dover to calais occupied four hours i crept into my native land under the protection of a foreign name doubly hidden in the obscurity of the swiss lasagna and in my own i set foot on france with the century end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty five dear eighteen thirty six revised in december eighteen forty six my stay at dieppe two societies whilst writing these memoirs you know that i have changed my abode many times and have often described those places and uttered opinions which they suggested i have thus retraced my recollections mixing up the history of my thoughts and of my various homes with the history of my life you see where i am now walking this morning on the cliffs behind the castle of dieppe my eye rested on the postern which communicates with them by means of a bridge over the moat by this postern madame de longueville escaped from queen anne of austria and having embarked secretly at havre and landed at rotterdam she went to stenay to marshal de turenne the conquerors of the great captain were no longer innocent and the exiled scoffer did not treat the guilty with any mercy madame de longueville freed from the enmity of the hotel de rambouillet the throne of versailles and the municipality of paris became passionately attached to the author of les maximes la rochefoucauld and continued as faithful to him as she was able he survives less from his thoughts than from the friendship of madame de lafayette and of madame de sevigne from the verses of la fontaine and the love of madame de longueville such is the value of illustrious attachments the princess of conde being on her deathbed, said to madame de brienne my dear friend inform that pauvre miserable who is at stenay of the state in which you now see me and let her learn to die fine words the princess however forgot that she herself had been loved by henry the fourth that when taken to brussels by her husband she had been anxious to rejoin the bearnese to escape by night through a window and afterwards to ride on horseback thirty or forty leagues she was then a pauvre miserable seventeen years of age having come down from the cliffs i found myself on the high road to paris on going out of dieppe the road ascends rapidly to the right the wall of a cemetery rises on the sloping side of a bank and along this wall runs a rope walk two rope makers walking backwards in parallel lines and balancing from lake to lake were singing together in a low voice i listened to their song they were just at the following couplet of the via caporal a fine poetical falsehood which has brought us where we are qui la bas sanglote et regarde et c'est la veuve du tombeau etc etc these men sung the chorus conscrit au pas ne pleurez pas marchez au pas au pas in a tone so manly and pathetic that tears started to my eyes whilst keeping the step and reeling off their hemp they had the air of spinning out the last moments of the via caporal i cannot describe the charm peculiar to beranger though exhibited merely by two sailors who in sight of the sea celebrate the death of a soldier the cliffs recall to my mind monarchical greatness the highway plebeian celebrity i compared in my mind the men who constitute the two extremes of society i asked myself to which of these two periods i would have wished to belong when the present shall have disappeared like the past which of these two kinds of renown will most strongly draw towards it the respect of posterity and nevertheless if deeds were everything if the value of names did not form in history a counterpoise to the value of events what a difference there is between my time and the time which passed from the death of henry the fourth to that of mazarin what were the disturbances of sixteen forty eight compared with those of this revolution which has swallowed up the old conditions of society and which will die perhaps leaving neither old nor new society have i not had to draw in my memoirs pictures of incomparably greater importance than the scenes related by the duc de la rochefoucauld even at dieppe what was the careless and voluptuous idol of paris seduced and rebellious in comparison with the duchesse de berry 
the salvos of artillery which announced to the sea the presence of the royal widow no longer thunder the flatteries of powder and smoke have left nothing on the shore but the murmuring of the waves the two daughters of the house of bourbon anne genevieve and marie caroline have withdrawn the two sailors in the song of the plebeian poet will be forgotten dieppe is empty of myself it was another self and that of my early days already ended who formerly dwelt in these places and this self has perished for our days die before ourselves here you have seen me as a little sub-lieutenant in the regiment of navarre drilling recruits on the sands you have also seen me an exile under bonaparte you will meet me again when the days of july overtake me here i am still and i resume my pen to continue my confessions in order to know where we are it may be useful to cast a glance on the state of my memoirs retrospect of my memoirs that has happened to me which happens to every man who works on a grand scale i have in the first place raised the wings on the extremities then displacing and replacing my scaffolding hither and thither i have raised the stones and mortar of the intermediate structures several centuries were employed in completing the gothic cathedrals if heaven grant me life the monument shall be finished during the course of different years the architect will always remain the same only changed in age besides it is a punishment to preserve the intellectual being intact imprisoned in a material envelope almost worn out st augustine when he became sensible of his bodily decay said to god keep my soul in thy tabernacle and to men when you have learned to know me in this book pray for me six and thirty years must be reckoned between the things last spoken of and those in which i am now engaged how is it possible to resume with any degree of ardour an account of subjects which long ago inspired me with passion and fire when those are no longer alive of whom i am about to speak and the object is to resuscitate images frozen in the depths of eternity to descend into a funereal cavern in order to enjoy life am not i myself as it were dead have not my opinions changed do i now see objects from the same point of view have not those personal trials about which i was so much troubled and those general and astounding events which accompanied or followed them fallen off in importance in the eyes of the world as well as in my own whenever the life of a man is greatly prolonged his mind becomes blunted and cold the interest of the evening has passed away before the morrow when i search into my thoughts there are names and even personages which escape my memory though they may have made my heart beat vanity of men forgetting and forgotten it is not enough to say to our dreams and our love revive in order to give them life again the region of the shades cannot be entered except by a golden branch and it requires a youthful hand to pluck it End of chapter 35chapter thirty six of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty six dieppe eighteen thirty six year eighteen hundred sight of france arrival in paris au convenant de la res pace rabelais having been shut up for eight years in great britain i had only seen the english world so different and especially at that time from all the rest of european society as the packet-boat from dover approached calais in the spring of eighteen hundred my looks were strained towards the coast i was struck with the air of poverty exhibited by the country only a few masts were to be seen in the harbour a population in cotton caps danced along the jetty before us the conquerors of the continent were announced to us by the noise of their wooden shoes as soon as we came alongside the quay gendarmes and custom-house officers leapt on board and examined our luggage and passports in france every man is suspected and the first thing one sees in our business as well as in our amusements is a three-cocked hat and a bayonet mrs lindsay was waiting for us at the inn and next day she madame d'arceau a young person her relation and myself set out for paris on the road we saw scarcely any men women dirty and ragged with bare feet and heads either altogether without covering or bound by a handkerchief were everywhere busy working in the fields they might have been taken for slaves i ought rather to have been struck with the independence and manliness of a country where the women handle the spade whilst their husbands handle the musket it might have been supposed that a conflagration had passed over the villages they looked miserable and dilapidated 
on all hands mud or dust dunghills and ruins on the right and left of the road appear dismantled or ruined chateau nothing remained of their felled woods and plantations except a few squared pieces of timber on which children were at play the fences of the enclosures were broken down and the churches abandoned from which the dead had been carried away there were steeples without bells graveyards without crosses and saints without heads built up in their niches the walls were daubed over with these republican inscriptions already become old liberty equality fraternity or death in some cases attempts had been made to blot out the word death but the black or red letters were still visible under a layer of whitewash the nation which appeared to have reached the moment of dissolution was recommencing a fresh condition of life like the nations issuing from the night of barbarism and from the desolation of the middle ages as we approached the capital between econ and paris the ash trees had not been felled i was struck with the beautiful avenues formed by the road which are unknown in england france was as new to me as the forests of america had previously been st denis was unroofed its windows broken the rain fell into its aisles already becoming green and the tombs were destroyed i have seen since there the bones of louis the sixteenth the cossacks the coffin of the duc de berry and the cenotaph of louis the eighteenth auguste de lamoignon came to meet mrs lindsay his elegant equipage formed a remarkable contrast with the lumbering carts and the dirty and torn diligences drawn by hacks harnessed with ropes which i had met since leaving calais mrs lindsay lived at Tern. i alighted at the road to lyewalt and reached the house of my hostess across the fields i remained at her house four and twenty hours and there i met with a certain tall and stout m la salle who was employed by her in arranging the affairs of the emigres she sent to inform m de fontaine of my arrival at the end of about eight and forty hours he came to see me in a small room which mrs lindsay had taken for me in an inn almost at her door it was sunday about three o'clock in the afternoon we entered paris on foot by the barriere de l'etoile at present we can form no idea of the impression which the excesses of the revolution had made on men's minds throughout europe and especially on the minds of those who were absent from france during the reign of terror it seemed to me as if i were literally going down into hell i had been a witness it is true of the beginning of the revolution but its great crimes had not then been committed and i had remained under the yoke of subsequent facts such as these facts were related in the midst of the well-regulated and peaceful society of england going forward under my assumed name and persuaded i was compromising my friend fontaine i heard with great astonishment on entering the champs elysees the sounds of a violin a horn clarinet and drum i saw tents in which men and women were dancing and in the distance the palace of the tuileries appeared at the extremity of its two large woods of chestnut trees the place louis XV was bare it had the dilapidated melancholy and abandoned air of an ancient amphitheatre people passed on quickly i was particularly surprised at not hearing lamentations and was afraid of putting my foot into some pool of blood of which there remained not a trace i found it impossible to withdraw my eyes from that quarter of the sky where the instrument of death had been erected i thought i saw before me in undress my brother and my sister-in-law bound near the bloody machine there the head of louis the sixteenth had fallen notwithstanding all the merriment in the streets the towers of the churches were mute it appeared to me as if we were entering on good friday the great day of our lord's passion m de fontaine lived in the rue saint honore in the neighbourhood of saint roche he took me to his house and presented me to his wife and then conducted me to the house of his friend m joubert where i found a temporary asylum i was received as a traveller of whom they had heard some accounts the next day i went to the office of the police under the assumed name of m de lasagne to deposit my foreign passport and to receive in exchange a permission to remain in paris which was renewed to me from month to month at the end of a few days i took an entresol in the rue de lille on the side next to rue de saint pere i had brought with me the genie du christianisme and the first sheets of that work printed in london i had been directed to m mignoret a worthy man who consented to undertake the charge of the work to proceed with the printing interrupted in london and to advance something for my subsistence in the meantime not a soul knew anything about my essai sur les révolutions notwithstanding what had been told me by m lemierre i found out the old philosopher de l'isle de salle who had just published his memoir en faveur de dieu and i went to the house of ganguené the latter lived in the rue de grenelle saint germain near the hotel of bonne la fontaine there was still legible on his door here the title of citizen is regarded as an honour and people tutoyer one another shut the door if you please 
I went up. M. Ganguené, who hardly recognised me, spoke to me of his great dignity and of all that he was and had been. I modestly withdrew and never attempted to renew a connection so disproportioned. I always cherished in my heart the recollection of and regret for England. I had lived there so long that I had adopted all its usages. I could not endure the dirtiness of our houses, stairs and tables, our want of neatness, our noise, familiarity, and the absurdity of our talk. I had become English in manners, tastes, and to a certain extent in my manner of thinking. For if, as it is alleged, Lord Byron was sometimes inspired in his child Harold by René, it must be confessed that eight years' residence in England, preceded by a voyage to America, and the long habit of speaking, writing, and even thinking in English, had produced a necessary effect on the turn and expression of my ideas. But by degrees I began to enjoy the sociable qualities which distinguish us, that communion of mind, so charming, so rapid, and so easy, that absence of all haughtiness and prejudice, that disregard of fortune and names, and that natural level of all ranks, that equality of mind, which renders French society incomparable, and redeems our faults. After being established for some months amongst us, a feeling grows up that it is impossible to enjoy life except in Paris. End of chapter 36《ハッシュタグ・ポッドキャスト》Chapter 37 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 37. Paris, 1837, Year 1800, My Life in Paris. I shut myself up in the depths of my entresol and devoted myself wholly to work. In the intervals of relaxation, I made excursions round about to reconnoitre. In the middle of the Palais Royal, a circus had been erected. Camille Desmoulins no longer harangued the mob in the open air. Troops of prostitutes, the attendant satellites of the goddess of reason, no longer went about in processions under the direction of David as manager and leader. At the entrance of every passage and in all the galleries were to be met men. Who announced all kinds of curiosities, hommes chinois, vieux d'optique, cabinet de physique, bête étrange. Notwithstanding all the heads that had been cut off, there still remained some idlers. Bursts of music continually proceeded from the cellars of the Palais Marchand, accompanied by the noise of great drums. It was there, perhaps, that those giants dwelt for whom I was seeking, and who must necessarily have produced immense events. I went down. A subterranean ball was going on in the midst of spectators sitting and drinking beer. A little hunchback planted on a table was playing the fiddle and singing a hymn to Bonaparte, which ended with these lines: "Par ses vertus, par ses attraits, il méritait d'être le père." A sou was given him at the close of the set, such as the basis of that human society which bore an Alexander and which was sustaining Napoleon. I visited the places where I had walked during the dreams of my early years. From the convents of former times, the clubbers had been driven away after the monks. Wandering about behind the Luxembourg, I came upon the Chartreuse. Its demolition was just being completed. The Place de Victoire and the Place Vendôme lamented the absent statues of the Grand Roi. The community of the Capuchins had been plundered, and the inner cloisters were used as a place for the exhibition of Robertson's Fantasmagorie. At the Cordeliers, I asked in vain for the Gothic nave, where I had seen Marat and Danton in their prime. On the quay of the Théâtre, the church of that body had been converted into a coffee house and a room for rope dancing. At the door was an illumination representing the amusements within, and written in large letters, "Admission gratis." I pushed on with the crowd into this cave of iniquity. I had no sooner got a seat than waiters entered with napkins in their hands, shouting like madmen, "Consommez, monsieur, consommez!" I did not wait to be told twice, and I stole away sadly. To avoid the jeers of the company, because I had nothing wherewith to consomme. Change of society. The revolution may be divided into three parts, which have nothing in common among them: the republic, the empire, and the restoration. These three different worlds, all as completely finished one as the other, appeared as if separated by centuries. Each of these conditions of society had a fixed principle: the principle of the republic was equality, that of the empire power, and that of the restoration liberty. The republican period was the most original and most deeply marked, because we never have seen, nor ever shall see, physical order produced by moral disorder, unity resulting from the government of the multitude, the scaffold substituted for law, and obeyed in the name of humanity. In eighteen o one, I was present at the second social transformation. The confusion was ridiculous. 
By means of a suitable disguise, numbers of people passed for persons whom they were not. Each wore his nickname, or his borrowed one, suspended from his neck, as the Venetians during the carnival carry a small mask in their hands to indicate that they are masked. One was reputed to be an Italian, another a Spaniard, a third a Prussian, and a fourth a Dutchman. I was a Swiss. A mother passed as the aunt of her son, a father as the uncle of his daughter. The proprietor of an estate was only its manager. This movement recalled to my mind in an opposite sense the movement of 1789, when the monks and various religious orders were driven out of their cloisters, and the old condition of society was overrun by the new. The latter, after having displaced the former, was again displaced in its turn. However, an orderly society began to spring up. People deserted the cafes and the street to enter into domestic life. The remnants of the family circle were collected. The inheritance was reconstructed by gathering up the wrecks, as the rappel is beaten after a battle to see how many have been lost. All the churches that remained entire were reopened. I had the happiness of blowing the trumpet at the door of the temple. It was easy to distinguish the old republican generation which withdrew from the imperial generation which advanced. Generals, who had sprung up in emergencies, poor, rude in speech, and severe in mien, who had brought home nothing from all their campaigns except wounds and ragged coats, were continually coming in contact with the brilliant and laced officers of the consular army. The emigre returned home, conversed quietly with the murderers of some of his kindred. All the porters, who were great partisans of the late Monsieur de Robespierre, regretted the spectacles of the Place Louis XV, where, as my own landlord in the Rue de Lille told me, they cut off him's heads, whose necks were as white as a chicken's skin. The Septembriseurs, having changed their name and their quarters, had become dealers in baked apples at the corners of the streets, but they were often obliged to give up their calling because the people who recognised them upset their stalls and were disposed to abuse them. The revolutionists, who had become enriched, began to keep establishments in the large hotels in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, which had been sold. On the way to be created barons and counts, the Jacobins spoke of nothing but the horrors of 1793, and the necessity of chastising the working classes and putting down the excesses of the mob. Bonaparte, putting Brutuses and Scaevolas in his police, was preparing to bedeck them with ribbons, to bedaub them with titles, to force them to betray their opinions and to dishonour their crimes. In the midst of all this, a new generation shot up vigorously, sown in blood and growing up, no longer to shed any except that of the foreigner. From day to day the transformation proceeded of republicans into imperialists and of the tyranny of the whole, into the despotism of one. End of chapter 37 End of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800